Uh, my name's Meg Linton. I'm still the mostly new CEO of the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation. And I'm really thrilled that you're all here today. This is a very popular topic um, and has been in the news a lot lately. And I just wanted to ask before I do introductions and so forth, um, how many of you are foundation members? Oh, thank you. This is really wonderful. Your foundation membership helps make these programs happen along with our partnership with UCI Health and our funders of this uh, specific program, Mike and Polly Smith. So if you could give Mike and Polly Smith a round of applause, that would be wonderful. And I also wanted to make sure that you um, get, if you haven't gotten one already, this is our new brochure that lists the entire Medicine in Our Backyard series for the next, well, this is, there's a total of eight lectures. So there's one a month over the next few months. So hopefully you'll pick one of those up and also um, we have all of our information available online on our website as well. Um, so that's that. And then we also just published our brand new um, bookmark magazine, um, which tells you about what's coming up with our library live series and our witty lecture series, which is our distinguished lecture series. So there's lots of really, really great events coming up and I hope you'll pick one up and hopefully enjoy reading it. So tonight, um, Dr. Brent Young is here. He's assistant clinical professor for UCI Health in the Department of um, Anesthesiology and Perioperative Care. And he's going to discuss, discuss the use of cannabis for pain, fact, fiction, and everything in between. Cannabis is being touted as a panacea for just about anything that ails you. Um, claims have been made that it lowers blood sugar, slows al Alzheimer's disease, and alleviates a wide range of psychological problems, from anxiety and depression to PTSD and psychosis. But few studies ha have been done on cannabis, and that's why Dr. Young is here to tell us all about it. A little background on Dr. Young. He is um, a UCI health anesthesiologist who specializes in, in the management and treatment of pain. His clinical interests include interventional procedures for chronic pain, pain management, and the use of cannabis in relieving pain. Young's research interests involve developing new methods to measure and treat pain, including, the dis including discovering pain biomarkers, determining cannabis' effectiveness in adjuvant pain relief, and identifying bio biomarkers for intoxication. He provides hands-on practical instruction to medical students, residents, and fellows. He earned his medical degree at Georgetown University School of Medicine in Washington, D.C. He interned in general surgery at MedStar Washington Hospital Center and completed a residency in anesthesiology at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. We are fortunate to have Dr. Young in OC, and I found out that he grew up here, too. Um, and so he's a local boy who's come home. Um, he is passionate about his roles as a physician, teacher, and researcher. He sees his patients at, and in the perioperative and outpatient settings at UC Irvine Medical Center in Orange and at UCI Health in your Belinda specialty. So please welcome Dr. Young. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for having me tonight. It's really a great, <laughs> it's really a great honor for me to be speaking in front of you tonight. Um, I remember when this library first opened in the 90s and um, I had been going to the Corona Del Mar branch and um, I started coming here and studying and every meaningful test that I have ever studied for I studied four here, and <laughs> it got me into UC Berkeley, it, it got me into Georgetown, and also got me in a fellowship here at UC Irvine, so I owe a lot uh, to this library and the wonderful facility that it is. Um, so tonight, I think all of you are interested in cannabis. Um, I really like this uh, title that I stole from the library public, uh, the publicity for this uh, talk, fact, fiction, and everything in between, because there is very little fact on the clinical implication of cannabis. There is even more fiction, and on top of that, even more of the everything in between. 
Uh, but I, hopefully I can clear some of the questions that you have up and maybe provoke more questions. So I have no disclosures. There are no uh, cannabis uh, industries that uh, are funding me. Um, and I have no investments in any cannabis industries for or against the use of cannabis. So as I was doing uh, the research for this lecture, I just wanted to look up all the images and publicity that's out there. This is all found on Google. Um, so on the left, there's a, a billboard that says, Child Poison Center calls increased five times after marijuana legalization in, in one of the states that legalized cannabis. Um, so that makes me not really think that cannabis is a very good thing. Uh, but on the right, there's another billboard that says, since legalizing marijuana in 2012, Colorado has no increase in youth marijuana usage, and neither has Washington. So clearly there's a dis discrepancy of you know, what is, what is really the fact behind these billboards? This is another uh, advertisement for and against uh, cannabis. I know it's, it's a little bit hard to read, uh, but so I'll read it out for you. On the, on the top left it says, regular marijuana use can cause depression, anxiety, and bipolar disorder in both adolescents and adults. Uh, a breastfeeding baby can absorb as much as eight times more THC than its mother. Using marijuana under the age of 25 can cause long-lasting damage to the brain. And smoking marijuana creates the same toxins and cancer-causing chemicals as smoking cigarettes. Um, and I like in this on the left, it all says it can, so that means that it also cannot do those things as well. Um, on the right, there's a, another billboard that says beer, wine, and safer. So that gives us this sense of security that says that cannabis is safer than drinking beer or wine. And I don't know of the studies that prove that. So the objectives of this uh, talk I do want to give you just a small brief history of the cannabis and, and the history and the historical basis of using cannabis. Um, some of the red tape around its use and why it's not really widely or hasn't been widely used up until very recently. Um, it is important to understand what the system in our bodies, what, is, what cannabis is affecting, and that's mainly the endocannabinoid system. And what does the endocannabinoid system, uh, has, what, is, what is its function um, in, our, in our bodies? Uh, what the major cannabinoids of interest are? Um, and then what is the evidence that we have for some of the clinical conditions that people say that cannabis is good for? Um, I'll talk about practic practical use of cannabis, the roots of administration, how people are using it, and what we know of those different roots of administration. Um, and then just briefly, we'll talk about some of the research that's being done at UCI. So this is the history. It started being used, first documented use was in China thousands and thousands of years ago. Uh, approximately 27,000 BC. Um, and so it's been used for as long as I, it, you know, as long as the history of humans have been around uh, for a lot of uh, medical conditions. Uh, in China, it was used for autoimmune diseases, for pain, uh, for inflammatory diseases. In Egypt, it was used for hemorrhoid pain, and for eye pain, like glaucoma, theoretically. Um, and, uh, and then it made its way to Europe and America. And in America, um, it was the most widely used drug between 1850 and 1942. So it was uh, uh, an actual part of our pharmacopoeia, which is basically the index of drugs that people can prescribe to patients. Um, and it was the what most widely pop popularized uh, prescription drug. Um, so what happened, um, and I'm not sure exactly what happened, but I think it was mainly the 
you know, these claims that have been, uh, that were popularized at the time, uh, demonizing the use of marijuana. So on the left, it's an image of uh, somebody using marijuana and then basically progressing and starting to use uh, heroin and becoming addicted to heroin. And uh, it was labeled this gateway drug that opens the door to much worse drug use and addiction and uh, even death. Um, in America, though, uh, within the last couple of decades, uh, the rise in cannabis approval and use uh, has definitely been become popular. Uh, over, I think this is a little bit dated, this slide, it was in November 7th, 2018. Um, but now there are over 33 states and the District of Columbia that have uh, legalized cannabis uh, for med medicinal use. Um, and 10 states, including the District of Columbia, that uh, has legalized it for recreational use. And as I see the coming years, that I, f I believe that most of this country is going to have or be, have people use cannabis or legalize cannabis for some sort of use um, in the coming years. So I think this, this whole map is gonna be green in the next 10 to 20 years uh, because of the medical implications cannabis has. Uh, so, in cannab so in California, uh, in 2016, we uh, legalized it for recreational use. We were the first state to legalize it for medicinal use in, I believe, 1996. Um, so that means everybody can use it, not just for medical conditions, but for recreational uses as well. Um, some of the terminology that's important to define is uh, marijuana is actually the slang term for cannabis, uh, and cannabis is actually the scientific name for it. And so I like to refer uh, to cannabis by its, uh, its proper scientific uh, nomenclature. Um, and then the subspecies are indica, sativa, ruderalis, which are the main subspecies that have been classified and characterized. Um, another term for cannabis that's commonly used is hemp. And hemp uh, is uh, the plant that has less than 0.3% THC content and was mainly produced for its fiber. But now, recently, people are realizing that cannabis has a lot of other uh, potential cannabinoids within the plant that can be used, like CBD um, and, and other uh, cannabinoids. Uh, that can be potentially helpful in several different medical conditions. So uh, they're really utilizing hemp now to produce uh, these other cannabinoids that do not have THC in them. So the endocannabinoid system uh, is the system that our body, uh, or that this plant works on. Uh, it's similar and evolved in parallel to many other systems that we have, but one of them is the opioid system uh, that also controls pain and also a lot of other bodily functions. Uh, it evolved over 600 million years ago. It's found in every animal species that has a vertebrae. Um, and we do know that it evolved much uh, further in the past than uh, the plant. So the plant, we first find the plant about 25 million years ago. So we do know that our own bodies create naturally occurring cannabinoids that affect this system. Uh, the main components of the endocannabinoid system are these two receptors, CB1 and CB2, which stand for cannab cannabinol receptor 1 and cannabinol receptor 2. Uh, they have many roles in our human function. Uh, they include regulating hunger, uh, uh, energy metabolism. Uh, they have a role in our brain and neuroplasticity. Uh, they have a role in pain, painful memory, suffering. Uh, they have a role in our blood vessels, so uh, they can cause uh, you know, regulation of our blood pressure and our heart rate. 
Um, it also has a role in our immune system, uh, connective tissue repair, and also behavior. Uh, there are several different classifications of cannabinoids. So within the plant, we do know there's cannabinoids and there's also uh, something called terpenoids, which are uh, what give cannabis its strong smell. Uh, the types of different cannabinoids are endocannabinoids, so the ones that are uh, naturally occurring in our body. There are synthetic cannabinoids, so the cannabinoids that we make in the lab to mimic uh, cannabinoids and affect those receptors. Uh, and the third type are phytocannabinoids, which are the ones that we find naturally in the plant. Uh, the two main ones that we have studied the most are THC and CBD. Uh, but there are over, actually it's not 80, but it's over 100 now that we have discovered. Uh, and we don't really know what all of these other minor cannabinoids do. There are several labs across the world that are trying to figure out uh, what those cannabinoids do. Um, the terpenoids are also something that people are uh, studying as well. It does have, it was thought to just contain the smell of the plant, but people are realizing that potentially terpenoids also have an effect uh, on pain and other medical conditions. So this is THC. It comes in a form called THCA, and when you heat it up, it becomes this active form of THC. It was discovered in 1964. It contains the psychoactive component of cannabis. Uh, it is believed to have an effect on these different types of pain, so neuropathic pain, chronic pain, or cancer pain, and I'll go into more detail uh, later on in this uh, lecture. Um, but one of the metabolites, so the THC is broken down in the liver, um, and it's broken down into a, a much more psychoactive form called 11-OH-THC. Um, it is four times more psychoactive than regular THC, um, and that has an effect on uh, the form of, th of cannabis that you consume. So whether or not you smoke it or you eat it, it can affect you differently in terms of the psychoactive component that uh, we're talking about here. CBD uh, is cannabidiol. It was actually discovered before THC in 1940. Uh, it also has this, these two different forms, CBDA, which is its, it's non-active form, and then it gets heat, when you heat it up, it becomes its active form of CBD. Um, it actually is not psychoactive. It blocks the formation of this very psychoactive metabolite of THC. Uh, and it also kind of blocks or modulates some of the unwanted side effects of THC. So some of the unwanted side effects of THC include anxiety, dysphoria, panic attacks, paranoia, um, and there is the question of whether or not this combination of these two improves the medicinal benefit of cannabis. Uh, and the, I think the jury is still out on, on that. Uh, so what is Im important in the, uh, the, uh, uh, the product of cannabis that is being used is that we do know that there are these three main strains, indica, sativa, and ruderalis of can cannabis. Um, but the names really don't matter as much as the chemical profile. And when I, mean, when I say chemical profile, I mean uh, what are those active components in the product that people are taking. So what is the ratio of CBD to THC? And then f further research needs to be done on the, the mo more minor cannabinoids and what are, what are those effects that are having. But that, that chemical profile gives whatever medicinal effect cannabis is going to have its, its, its uh, characteristic. Um, there are over 600 different species now because people have been uh, hybridizing them, crossbreeding them, making all sorts of different types of cannabis with different chemical uh, compositions. And I, I say 600 here, but I bet you that there are, are much more than that now. Uh, so 
so these are some of the claims that it makes. So, so what we see, uh, you know, on the streets or on, on the internet is that, well, CBD can reverse my aging, or I can be an Olympic athlete. <laughs> so, <laughs> but what is real? I, I don't know of any evidence that shows that these claims are actually true. What are the actual potential benefits of cannabis? And these. Are the these are these are this is a list of the potential can, uh, benefits of cannabis that actually have some uh, scientific basis behind them. So it is a strong anti-emetic. So people who get sick from chemotherapy, uh, it one a synthetic cannabis called Marinol has been approved for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Uh, there is strong evidence to show that it helps with nausea vomiting, uh, particularly uh, due to chemotherapy. Uh, anorexia is also another indication for it. So people who have AIDS uh, and have anorexia, poor appetite from AIDS, people can take uh, cannabis and it helps with their appetite. Uh, it has also, there's also strong evidence to show that it is a good antispastic agent in patients who have uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, it was recently FDA approved as an anti-epileptic or anti-convulsant uh, for rare uh, childhood forms of ep epilepsy uh, called Dravet's syndrome. Uh, these last two here are, have, not, have, have not shown uh, very strong evidence, mainly in the preclinical models, meaning that mainly in mice, mouse models, is being shown to have some sort of neuroprotective effect and anti-tumor effect, which, you know, obviously further research needs to be done to prove those claims. Um, but at least uh, as a neuroprotective uh, 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 indication, it shows that in mouse models, it potentially re reduces the amyloid plaques and Alzheimer's disease. So its role in treating pain mainly is due to these two receptors again. Uh, the CB1 receptors are mainly located in the central nervous system, meaning it's lo they're located in the brain and the spinal cord and some in the peripheral nerves as well. Uh, the CB2 receptors are mainly located in the uh, organs of immune function, so organs that cause inflammation or propagate inflammation or calm down inflammation. Uh, so the effect of these two can have a synergistic effect, so mainly reducing the, uh, the painful impulses that are coming up through the spinal cord into the brain. Uh, and then the CB2 effect potentially has this anti-inflammatory effect that helps also with pain. So these are some of the landmark studies that have shown its effect for pain. Uh, on the top left is a, a study that shows that cannabis is good in painful HIV uh, neuropathy. Uh, the top right was a study out of UC San Diego by Mark Wallace, uh, who's a very famous uh, cannabis researcher who has sh shown that it helps uh, reduce uh, uh, hyperalgesia that's induced in a lab. Uh, it also has been shown to be good for neuropathic type pain um, and in some cases fibromyalgia. There is a caveat to these studies, though, is that, yes, it, it did show these, these claims are true, but a lot of these uh, studies were on patient populations that were very, very small. So 20 to 40 uh, was the sample size for m many of these studies. Uh, they didn't follow these patients for a very long amount of time, usually at most about a month. Uh, so we really don't know what the evidence is long term. So is it helpful for forever or is it only helpful for a couple of weeks? Um, and what happens if I'm taking this medication for weeks, months, and years? Do I develop tolerance? Do I develop uh, other uh, problems? And we just don't know because the research has not been done. Um, 
this is also another uh, schematic of uh, patients who undergo orthopedic surgery. It just shows that more and more people are using cannabis to treat pain, particularly after having surgery. So of the people who had traumatic fractures, 20% or 21% used cannabis in the uh, post-operative period to treat their pain. And of those people, 90%, uh, about 90% said that it was helpful for their pain uh, after surgery. Um, but some of the things that we're really interested in is how is it affecting all my other bodily functions? So does it affect my lungs? Is it affecting my heart? Uh, does it affect my kidneys or liver? Um, and a lot of the claims that for and against, some say that, so, so for people that are against cannabis, it's that they say that it causes lung cancer. For people who say it's for cannabis, that they say it doesn't cause lung cancer. But this study shows uh, pretty definitively, it, it was a very, very large study on 2,159 cannabis smokers, and they followed them for an extended period of time. Um, and it showed that there was little to no evidence that uh, people who smoked cannabis had an increased risk of lung cancer. So there was no link between lung cancer and cannabis smoking. Uh, what it does have an effect on the respiratory system is that it can cause you to have chronic bronchitis. So people who are smoking cannabis or vaporizing it, uh, it's thought that the heat of the smoke causes irritation in the lungs, which can cause you to have chronic bronchitis. Uh, Usually this reverses itself uh, if you stop smoking cannabis. So it's, there's really the long-term risk of it isn't, um, uh, isn't too bad, but it is bad if you have other lung issues, like if you're also a chronic smoker and have COPD, or if you have asthma, uh, cannabis can uh, exacerbate uh, some uh, lung conditions. Um, and what is its effect on the heart? So we also don't have very much evidence to show what the effect of uh, cannabis smoking or cannabis consumption is on the heart. This was one study or one case report that showed that uh, a person who had never smoked cannabis before and had uh, heart disease that, they didn't, that was not diagnosed, they didn't know that they had heart disease, they tried the cannabis and it caused them to have a heart attack. Uh, and the reason why is because THC, one of the, the main active component, obviously, in cannabis that I've ta been talking about, uh, really makes your blood vessels a lot bigger, especially if you're not used to cannabis. Uh, so the first time this person took cannabis, likely their blood vessels got really, really big, and, when, and that causes a drop in your blood pressure. When your blood pressure drops, your heart tries to compensate by uh, that drop by beating faster. Um, and this is what likely happened in this patient is that their blood pressure dropped, their heart rate went up uh, and caused uh, a heart attack because they didn't know that they had uh, heart disease. But again, this is just one patient. Um, it's, it's hard to make any conclusive, uh, uh, conclusive you know, assumptions uh, with just one, pa uh, one patient case report. But it's something to you know, uh, proceed with the use of cannabis with caution. Um, how does it affect our brain? So there have been a lot of studies that show that it, it affects our uh, acute uh, learning, memory, and attention span. Uh, so when you are uh, uh, affected by cannabis acutely, it can affect your learning, your memory, and your attention. Uh, your short-term memory is usually worse uh, and Usually, though, when, you're, when you stop using cannabis, those uh, learning and memory and attention uh, deficits resolve. These are the common adverse effects. And this, when I say co common adverse effects, this is mainly uh, due to THC. Uh, so as you can see, it has a lot of adverse effects. It can make your eyes red. It can make you feel anxious. It can cause panic attacks. Uh, dry mouth, dizziness, make you not really feel good, um, uh, and changes your visual perception. 
So what are the drug interactions that we know of? Again, this has not been very widely studied, and we definitely need more uh, research to investigate the drug interactions of cannabis and other medications that people are taking. Um, but uh, we do know that THC affects the liver enzymes, and our liver metabolizes a lot of our drugs. So um, when we are either revving up some of the enzymes in our liver, that means that we are metabolizing some of the other medications that we're taking faster. Um, CBD is a liver enzyme inhibitor, so that just means that it's slowing down some of the metabolism uh, that the liver does. And so potentially can increase the level of, of medications that you're taking. Now, we haven't studied it very thoroughly. Uh, again, the, these studies that I list here have been on a couple of patients, uh, no more than five uh, in each study. Uh, but uh, as you can see, some have no effect, like uh, the, uh, idenavir and nalfinavir, which are HIV medications. Uh, THC and CBD use haven't shown any changes in the metabolism of those drugs. Uh, but other drugs like benzodiazepines, it can have an additive effect. So it can make you more sedated when you're combining it with uh, benzodiazepines, sometimes alcohol, people who are on blood thinners. Uh, it may increase the level of uh, warfarin, which is a, a common blood thinner people use. Um, so the evidence of drug interactions and the studies that have been done for, to, to know whether or not THC is safe or THC and CBD are safe for people taking these medications, we really don't have good evidence for. But we do know that they have an effect on other medications that we take. Some of the things that we definitely know that we should not be taking THC for are people who have uh, a psychosis or a psychiatric illness that is not stable. Um, there have been a lot of studies that, that have indicated that the use of THC can precipitate a psychotic episode. Uh, it can make uh, your psychiatric illness worse, um, sometimes can uh, initiate uh, schizophrenia. Uh, the relative contraindications, which mean that uh, you should be very, very careful when you're taking uh, or deciding to use a THC or CBD is people who have severe cardiovascular disease, severe liver uh, impairment or kidney disease, um, and, and people who are very, very sick. Uh, also, people who have uh, uh, heart conditions like a unstable arrhythmia or irregular heartbeat. But, you know, what a lot of people will tell you to is ask your doctor about medical marijuana. And the thing about asking your doctor about medical marijuana is, or it should be medical cannabis, but uh, is that a lot of medical schools don't really teach us about cannabis. So a lot of doctors uh, don't know very much about cannabis unless they have a particular interest in it. Uh, so I, I say this because if you ask your doctor about this, maybe they will pick up a book or look through the journals to find the evidence that you're, or to find the answer that you're asking, or find the answer to the question that you're asking. And they will learn more, and then they can teach you guys about what is and isn't indicated uh, in cannabis use. So the more practical things that I'll go over are, what are the administrations in different formulations, and what do we, what do we know about them? Um, so, on the left are the different routes of administration, uh, inhalation, uh, oral, sublingual, uh, and then top topical. Um, inhalation is, is definitely the most popular. Many people uh, use cannabis uh, by the inhalation route, and one of the good things about inhaling cannabis is that uh, you feel an effect very, very quickly. Uh, usually within five minutes, you'll feel whatever effect the cannabis product that you're taking uh, will have on you. Uh, and if it's not having any effect, then you can just inhale some more. 
Um, so it's very easily titratable or easily adjustable to the effect. Uh, if you're feeling good with the, the cannabis product, then you don't have to smoke anymore. Uh, the oral route uh, is, well, one of the downsides to the inhalation route is that it, it lasts probably the shortest, or it does last the shortest out of all of these uh, ways of taking cannabis, which can be good or bad. So if you know, you're having a good effect from the cannabis, it only really will last you an hour or two hours. Uh, but if you're having a really bad effect from the cannabis that you've smoked, uh, it will only last you an hour or two hours. Um, the oral, th oral route of administration, uh, one of the downsides is that the amount that's absorbed is really dependent on what, you, what is in your stomach. So if you've had a large meal, if you had a, a large fatty meal, or if you had a uh, a large carbohydrate-rich meal or the keto diets or protein-rich, then um, the amount that is absorbed through your stomach is altered. And uh, it's either you can absorb a lot more or uh, very little. Uh, if you don't have anything in your stomach, uh, you'll absorb it differently as well. Uh, but usually the oral route can have, it can take up to to half an hour, sometimes an hour and a half for it to start working. Um, and that's where a lot of people that I have met and have tried cannabis get into trouble because they'll try it and then um, not feel anything. And then they'll keep eating more of this cookie. And uh, eventually all of that THC and CBD will start having an effect on them. And some of them have had so much THC that they can't move and then they, they go to the emergency room and feel like they have had a stroke. When really, they're just really, really high. Um, so that's one of the downsides to the oral route of administration. The effect also will last a very, very long time as well. It will last the longest out of all of these. And um, it can last up to anywhere between four hours to eight hours. So if you're really having it's really making you feel good and helping with whatever condition that you're taking it for. It can really uh, last a long time. Uh, but if you're not feeling or you're having some of these side effects, uh, uh, these side effects, then it would be really bad to be experiencing that for four to eight hours. So that's, uh, you know, the good and the bad of the oral and inhalation. Uh, the other route of administration is sublingually or through your mouth or absorption through the mucosa of your mouth. Um, that's kind of somewhere in between uh, inhalation and oral. Uh, it usually takes about 15 minutes to 20 minutes, sometimes 30 minutes for uh, you to feel the effect of the cannabis. Um, and it has a moderate duration of action, so usually around three or four hours. Uh, and this is the way we usually tell patients to take cannabis because it doesn't really affect your lungs. It has a very stable amount that gets absorbed. It's not really, uh, it's not really affected by what you eat. Uh, and, uh, you know, it doesn't last eight, eight hours. Um, the other route of administration is the topical um, and route, which we really don't have very much research on the topical uh, solutions of cannabis. Um, there are people that say that the topical route of cannabis really doesn't produce any level of, of THC or CBD in your bloodstream. Uh, but the patients that I have uh, encountered who have used topical CBD and THC have, have had very good uh, effect from the topical formulation. So this is what you would maybe find in a cannabis dispensary. It's just an example of, of what you would, you would look for. Um, it, it should be tested uh, by a lab in California. Uh, it should tell you a lot number and the expiration date. Um, and it should tell you what is in uh, the product that you're taking. So in, in this one, it's actually probably too small for everybody to read, but it says that the effective THC dose is 23%. Uh, per gram of this product. It's got 2.4% uh, CBD and 0.8% uh, CBG, which 
again, is another minor cannabinoid. Um, but this product is mainly for recreational use because the THC content is very high and likely used for that psychogenic effect. Uh, these things on the right are uh, state dependent, uh, but it's just an indication of uh, that, that these companies need to put on their product to show that it does have a, can a cannabinoid in the product. Um, other than that, that's the main thing that those are used for. So take home, po take home points for my patients are, um, I usually like, most of my patients are using it for pain and uh, they're not using it recreationally or to get high or have the psychogenic effect of THC. So I usually have them take a product that has, that is higher in CBD than THC. Because like I was saying before, the CBD can modulate that, uh, those, those negative effects of THC. It's much better tolerated. Um, it potentially has that synergistic effect with THC. So uh, the anti-inflammatory effect of CBD and the possible uh, reduction in the pain sensations with uh, THC. Um, the problem with some of these products though that are high in CBD and THC is that it's very can be very expensive. Um, and uh, if it is cost prohibitive, I uh, will just tell them to kind of scale back on the CBD to THC ratio um, because it is cheaper, although you may have some of those uh, negative uh, side effects. Uh, usually I tell them to avoid edible because of the um, long duration of action, the variability of how much is absorbed through the stomach. Um, if they are going to try it, I usually tell them to use it sublingually or uh, inhaled. So some of, these are some of the resources uh, that you can use to look up more information about cannabis. Uh, UC San Diego has the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. Um, the Health Effects of Cannabis and Cannabinoids. So that's a book that's put out every year, or every 10 years, um, by the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, they uh, compile all of the research that's been done in the last 10 years and uh, create recommendations or uh, label what the uh, strength of the research is for certain health conditions. Uh, it was last published in 2016, um, so the next uh, edition will be in 2026. Uh, but uh, it is a very good resor resource. It goes through a lot of different medical conditions that cannabis has been studied for uh, and uh, really gives you what, what the strength of the evidence for those medical conditions is. Um, other resources is the Canadian Consortium for the Investigation of Cannabinoids um, and also the District of Columbia's Department of Health. I'm sure there are a lot of other resources as well. Um, but these are the ones that I usually use. So the research that we're doing at uh, UCI, uh, it's, uh, there's a wide variety of different things that we're studying. So we're looking at biomarkers to study um, pain and how it changes the pain sensation with the use of cannabis. Uh, we are looking at how we can use cannabis to help avoid using or reduce the amount of opioids people are using. Uh, we're studying it in the geriatric population, different pain populations as well. Um, we're also looking at uh, how cannabis affects uh, anesthetic management in patients who are undergoing surgery um, and how people or how these anesthesiologists have to change their uh, management of these patients. And that's it. This is uh, time for questions. Uh, this, we also have a UCI Center for the Study of Cannabis as well. Um, and uh, I'm part of it. Okay. Everybody. So can you stick around?
if anybody has any. Yeah. So he'll be able to stick around for about 10 more minutes if you have any questions that we weren't able to get to. So thank you all for coming. I hope you all signed in, and we'll see you later.